It's a blessing to be here with you, to be able to worship God together uh, with you today. Very thankful for everybody that's here. If you're visiting with us, we want to uh, let you know that we appreciate that you're here. We pray that you're uh, just as blessed as we feel blessed by you being here with us. For those of you that are live streaming along with us, welcome. It's a blessing to have you here as well. Um, we're so thankful that we're able to use technology this way to be able to uh, be there for people as uh, um, maybe illnesses get in the way or injuries or whatever it is, um, that you're able to join us uh, uh, through the live streaming as well. And so very, very thankful for being able to do that. Interestingly, with uh, um, our Outreach Sunday, we are in the midst of a series of looking at, because our, our theme for the year is Jesus says, I am the way. And the series that we began a couple of weeks ago, we're in the midst of looking at what the early Christians did with that truth. When they realized that Jesus says, I am the way, and they believed in that truth, what they did about that truth. And it's a really powerful, powerful thing for us to look at, especially as we look at the, um, oh, Bob, I'm so sorry. I totally forgot to do that out front and at first. So I, you know what I forgot to do, guys? It's, it's sweater, sweater weather, and it's like the end of May. And it's so, it's like, there's times that we say this, and we're kind of like, it's kind of hard to say today, but it is always true, regardless of how easy or hard it is to say. God is good. And all the time, amen, amen to that truth. So again, we're in the midst of the theme of the way, and we're looking at what early uh, Christians did about that truth, about Jesus being the way. And last week, we began the series by talking about the truth that the early Christians were devoted. They were devoted with every aspect of their life and who they were because they trusted in Jesus. They trusted in what God's plan was and who Jesus came to be. And so we read this verse, and this verse has kind of been a theme for the last two weeks. It shows up in Matthew chapter 6. We read the Luke 6 version of it earlier, but in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus says, this is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires of your heart will be also. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, he says that given will be given to you, and it, you'll, you'll receive in a great measure um, of what you have given. And so one of the things that we've got to notice and pay attention to when Jesus says this, brothers and sisters, that we've just got to call out that most of us read treasures in heaven as if it's pie in the sky, buy in the buy stuff, like it's far, far away. Store up treasures in heaven, because heaven is this place that's, that's far. But do you remember what Jesus taught us in the same sermon here, in Matthew chapter 6, when he taught us how to pray? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, which is heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when he tells us not to store up our treasures on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven, I think he's telling us something that we may have been missing sometimes when we think about what it means to be blessed with what we can give to God and trust him with. We may have missed what he, what, what he means by building up treasures in heaven. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So last week, to get into this theme and to get into this understanding, we talked about the early Christians as they were devoted. We were in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me, because I want to show you something there. Acts chapter 2. And I'm very thankful, by the way, after we read Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, and as we had a blood moon that Sunday evening, I knew very well that we were going to, and I guess a lot of you didn't, but I read in there, there's a prophecy in there, by the way, about the moon turning to blood and the sun going dark. None of you came to me that Sunday and go, oh no, Ty, is it the end of the time? I would have answered, yes, but the prophecy in Acts chapter 2 is about when Jesus died on the cross. It went dark when Jesus died. It was dark for a while when Jesus died. But what I want to redirect our thoughts to on this as we look at why we give, who we are as God's people, and what this means when Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will be also be. 
we need to look at this truth that in Acts chapter 2, at the end of his sermon, after he tells all of these Jewish people about Jesus and that the Messiah was actually here and he died, was crucified, was buried, and rose again on that third day, the very first thing that all the people do in verse number 36 is they look at them and say, brothers, actually verse 37, say, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter ends up responding then to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And this gift is for their children. Oh, and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this gift is for their kids, their kids' kids, and all generations after. And we got to read all that. And the key is what happens here in verse number 42. So if you have your Bibles, join me in Acts 2, verse number, number 42. Last week, we looked at how they were devoted and this week, we're going to look at a specific example of what they were devoted to. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. In the future, that's going to be really important that we pay attention to that. But look what happens next. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." So what we get to read there is that what the early church does immediately after believing in Jesus. Remember, 3,000 people were added to the church on the day of Pentecost. So our, our numbers might be slightly askew because we know that there were disciples along with the apostles that were there in the upper room. But there's definitely 3,011 plus people, right? There. And the very next thing they do is they devote themselves to this truth of following Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King, that Jesus is their Savior and their teacher. And we find this truth that one of the first things that they do is that they hold all things together in common. By the way, this isn't communism. We, we, there's some people that will read scripture and go through there and says that scripture promotes a certain form of communism and you got to see that. No, this is theocracy, however you would put it into that. This is kingdom of heaven stuff. This is a whole lot different than the arrogance and the um, greed of the world getting into there. These are people who have a different focus because it's about Jesus. It's no longer about themselves. And so they hold all things in common and they sell their possessions and belongings and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Well, the immediate thought on that is that usually as we read that, and if we only look and stop here in Acts chapter 2, as we go, wow, look, they just sold everything and nobody really had anything and everybody just ended up being okay. That's kind of cool. How did that all work out? And we begin to struggle with our ideas of what money really means to us. And we look at this and we feel bad about ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we are not intended to read this and go, oh, I've got a house. I feel bad about myself. I drove here in a vehicle. I feel bad about myself. You are not intended to read this as such. Instead, you are intended to read it as kingdom of heaven. Vision would have you do such. Let me give you a great example. When I was in high school, I was a nerd who tried to hide it. I, I got good grades really easily, and I, I, I loved reading, and I didn't like that other people knew that I loved reading, because I wanted to be one of the bad boys, and I didn't fit in with the jocks of the school, because I didn't play any sports, and I didn't fit in, well, I wanted to fit in with the cheerleader group, but they wouldn't let me, and so we had a really interesting setup at our high school, because when I started high school, there was only freshmen and sophomores. That was it. That's all we had at our school when it started. It was a brand new school. It was the very first year of that high school, Santiago High School, to begin. And being that it was in Southern California, we had some weird options of how we were able, like where we were able to eat for lunch while we were at school. And because it was such a small school, everybody ate at the same time. And Neosho, Haley, you'll have to remind me on this. Do you guys have like separate lunch hours or is everybody there at one time at Neosho High School? All one time? All one time. 
And so you have all the different groups of people that would separate out, and there's, different, there's a couple of different places to eat in the Osho High School, but it's all indoors because what's winter like out here? It's cold. Well, our school, you could eat, they had all these different like uh, pavilion type covered areas where there were benches outside with tables, like picnic tables outside, and there was also the gym where we could eat where they would set up tables in there. My freshman year, I wanted to be cool, and so I tried to sit with whatever group would have me, and uh, I floated around outside all the time because it was nice to be outside, and that's where all the, the sports stars, all the, um, the, the just groups I didn't fit in were at. My sophomore year, somehow I ended up making it into the gym. I do not remember how I got in there, but I ended up in the gym in a table where I ended up sitting for the next three years of my school year because the group that I was with, we, we fit, we clicked. I loved rollerblading, they loved skateboarding. We liked to throw ourselves off of stairs for some reason. We thought it was really a whole lot of fun. And uh, many of us loved talking about Jesus. We like to ask each other about the different denominations of, of churches that, that fit in there, and we would talk about the different things we believe. Sometimes we'd argue with each other about that. And uh, um, we would say, well, my preacher says this, and they would say, my preacher says this. But overall, we ended up talking about Jesus and talking about getting to know him better. Not everybody there liked talking about Jesus. Some people wanted to argue with us, but they stayed. And here's something that happened at our table that, to be honest, I didn't really ever catch. I, I, I didn't really notice this as it was going on. Invariably, at least once a week, maybe every other week, somebody would come to school and they had forgotten their lunch. Didn't that ever happen to you guys while you were going to school? Or we also had like lots of opportunities to be able to purchase uh, food. Like there was a cafeteria food. We have Taco Bell. Sorry, I know, know I'm bragging. You guys can, can get over this one. We had Pizza Hut that we could buy food from. And this, uh, the, a couple of other options. And they were like just different stands that we could buy food from. And so most of us, our parents would give us $20 at the beginning of the week. Because again, I'm bragging. Back then, $4 would get you a huge meal. Unlike today, $20 is like one meal almost. But we would be able to go and get food, or we would bring our food, and invariably there would almost always be, within a week or two, somebody that forgot their money, lost their money, or forgot to bring food. And so what ended up happening, and more than likely, I love John so much. Um, you've heard me talk about him in the past. I call him Preacher John, because he was one of the ones that loved to talk about Jesus the most and kept our group moral and good when, when some people in our group wanted to go in different high school directions, I think he was the first one who offered up somebody who didn't have any food as banana. And all the rest of us took up his mentorship and went, oh, hey, do you want one of the, our, our, our Twinkie or do you want my, half of my sandwich as well? <laughs> like we'd be like under our breath, like I don't really like it anyways. But we'd still all support each other. And what happened is every time that I would forget food or the end of the week came and I had accidentally spent all my money already that my mom had given me for lunch, people at the table would give a part of what they have. Here's the thing that I hope you noticed. When we gave to each other, did you notice that we, we all still had enough to eat? We were blessed to be able to give. And by the time most of us reached the age of 16, we were able to work, most of us at that table had jobs, and the amount ended up increasing. Our table became richer in the terms of what was available for people to eat. And the amount of people around our table ended up growing, so much so that our junior and senior year, we were multiple tables of people. And even people from outside would come and visit us. Like when my freshman year, I'd go and visit every other table, it started being the opposite way around. And it's because, I think it's because we had kingdom vision and we didn't even know it. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And we think of lunch as being like really nothing, but when somebody's really hungry that day and maybe they're having a test or something, it was huge that with that anxiety of not having anything to eat that they were able to eat even just that one meal. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Here's how I know this doesn't mean that they sold everything and did not have anything themselves so that they can give to somebody who had not. 
Acts chapter 5. I'm going to challenge you sometime this week, maybe today, to read Acts chapter 5 and 6 on your own. I'm going to go over them really quickly for time because um, I, I think the overall, the context of the story will teach a whole lot more than the details. But in Acts chapter 5, we come into a story where we find out that here's what a lot of people in the church were doing. Barnabas is a really good example. By the way, his name literally means son of encouragement. Barnabas had, uh, well, the church had grown from people that were traveling from different nations. When they came and heard that Jesus was Lord, they stayed in Jerusalem, which means that their belongings and everything were far, far away. They decided to move and just leave everything for the kingdom and stay there. So they had need. So the people that were living close by were helping to provide for their needs. And Barnabas decided to sell his stuff, his house, to be able to give for people. And other Christians started going, oh, this is a really good idea. We should do this too. We'll sell the extra things we have and be able to give. So a couple named Ananias and Sapphira sell their house. At least that's how I understand it when I read it in chapter 5. It almost seems to me like it's an extra house or a part of their property. They sell it, and they reason with each other and say, hey, let's keep a part of it and tell everybody that we're giving everything. And we read through that story. By the way, for those of you that grew up in the church, this is the story, just a reminder, this is the story of the couple. Ananias is the husband. He ends up dying first because Peter asks him, is this really everything? And he, um, he says, yeah, this is everything I got for the house. And they, they, he, they actually kept back a portion. They lied. And Peter says, how dare you lie against the Spirit? And he dies, and young men go and take his body out. And Sapphira comes in, almost passing as she comes in. And uh, he ask her the same question. I guess she doesn't realize that she just lost her husband, and she answers the same exact way. And most of us read that story, and we go, oh my goodness, it's so hard to be a Christian. These guys got, these guys got dead because of the, they didn't give all of the money. It's going to be so hard. Be, uh, we got to give all of our money? I'm going to argue that the answer is that we're, mis we're looking at that story wrong. Instead of looking at the amount of money, which is what we tend to do, because we tend to think in amounts, we didn't look at their story and look at their hearts and where their vision was at. I firmly think with all my heart, if they trusted in the Lord and didn't want to sell their house and give to other people, that they still would have been all right. I think they're trusting in their wealth and their resources and their popularity more than living in the kingdom. And so they end up having this issue and they end up losing their lives because they are living in the wrong kingdom. They're living in the kingdom of the world. You jump to Acts chapter 6 and you find out that there's a problem going on in the church with the Grecian widows not getting enough food during the daily distribution of food. The Jewish widows are getting all the food. And so the apostles are like, what are we going to do about this? We need to be devoted to teaching and praying. And they're like, I know what we'll do. Let's find seven guys that are spiritually strong, that are mature, and let's get them on this task so that they'll be able to do that. Interestingly enough, one of them is Barnabas. And Stephen get into this task, and they help to bless the Grecian widows. My question for you is, if everybody sold everything, and they had given to as anybody in need, where is the food coming for the Grecian widows and the Jewish widows day in and day out. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is about living continuously in God's creation. It's about having eyes to see and ears to hear and let's be honest, wallets that trust and that God is Lord and creator of all things and he put us on this planet in his image to have dominion over it not corruption. Why should we give? Because it's what God does. We're made in his image, and it's what he does. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Actually, I'm going to start in verse number 6. Pay attention to that. Again, my philosophy, my theory on the theocracy, or the theology and the theocracy on our I don't even know how to use a theo-economics term. Theo-economics, I guess, would be the terminology on it. On who we should be as God's people with our resources and our giving is 
profoundly declared here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 as Paul is talking to a church where they've already had a lot of problems with each other and he's continuing to remind them that it's about kingdom ethics and kingdom vision first. And he says this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. <laughs> it seems so like simple that we often miss the, the depth of what he's saying. It is really simple. If you want... Like, if you kill all the grass in your yard and you only throw out, like, three kernels of fescue out on there, how long is it going to take for your yard, your yard to be covered back up? You've got to cover the whole thing with seed, right? And with grass, you throw out a whole lot because there's times that, well, we'll use Jesus' words, that birds might take it up, that feet might trample it, and weeds might choke it out, correct? So you sow abundantly. So that way, the, it's abundant that's there. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now think about Ananias and Sapphira on that. Did you notice the reluctance? The reluctance wasn't in that they were going to hold back and keep some for themselves. It was in the lie that they told everybody else. Barnabas was a cheerful giver. It ended up being working out all right for him. So, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and the bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Did you notice that, what he just said there? He said, you will be rich. He doesn't say, all right, Christians, and this is what a lot of early Christians did in the second and third, well, really getting third and fourth century, is they became ascetics and they started throwing away all their wealth. And like one dude even like built a pole with all his wealth and then lived up on top of the pole for like two years, hoping that people would throw bread up to him and that they wouldn't see the waste that was down below the pole that he had left. They missed what the kingdom of heaven was all about. I want to read that again, verse number 11. By the way, I do not believe in the health and wealth gospel, which is this idea that if you follow Jesus, like if, that people on TV, those of you that are live streaming, I'm not a televangelist, so please don't look at it this way when I say this. If people are saying, if you send money to our ministry, your pocketbooks will overflow and stuff. That's not what Paul's saying, and that's not what Jesus says here. This is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it in a second. This is a, about, a, about the story. It's about your vision and your direction and everything. That's what you're going to be rich in. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also is also overflowing in the many thanksgivings to God. So what's the riches? It's the service, it's the blessings, and it's the praise to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and of the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Brothers and sisters, we must be more thoughtful and worshipful about the resources that God has blessed us with. That's both your talents and your financial abilities of what, what you've been blessed with. All throughout Scripture, men and women who are faithful tend to find themselves in positions of what we would call riches that others may be blessed. Esther became a queen. Ruth ended up being uh, um, married to Boaz, who owned, owned lots and lots of land that was there. David became king. Solomon's um, riches ended up blessing the people that were around him. And I'm going to argue that Jesus was the richest who ever lived on this earth, even though he walked with nothing. There is nothing wrong with having wealth, and there's nothing wrong with being poor. There's nothing wrong with being in between. 
The love of money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, is what Paul tells Timothy. In that passage that I just read in 2 Corinthians, I want you to notice that the gospel of Christ was talked about, the good news of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, we find out about the ministry of Jesus and what the whole truth of the ministry of Jesus is really all about. Here is what Jesus proclaimed. The time is fulfilled, which means the time is now, and the kingdom of God is at hand. It is tangible. It is a part of our lives now. Heaven is present. Heaven is with us. We're we're able to be a part of it. Look what Jesus tells everybody to do because of that truth. Repent and believe in this good news, in this gospel. Now, until this week, I'm reading a book um, about um, the, Jesus being the way, and until this week, I didn't know what the Greek word there was for repent. We, we usually use the terminology when we talk about what it means to repent is that we talk about it means turning away, right? And that sin was missing the mark. The word in Greek for repent is this, metanoia. It literally means, meta means to change or transform, noia means to know. It literally means to transform what you know. I love this definition. It's the journey of changing one's mind, heart, self, and way of life. Or number two, it's the act of reforming, of becoming new. When Jesus and disciples were here on earth, it, Jesus talked about money a lot. He talked about talents often. Um, oftentimes, he would link, such as in M- Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents, he would link the idea of what you do and what you own together into this idea saying that there are people that have kingdom vision, that are metonoia, that are repenting and living this transformed knowledge, this transformed newness of life, who are rich because of it. And there are people that are flat out missing it. Like the guy with only one talent where he said, Master, I know that you're hard and that you, that you keep what you're all about. Therefore, I buried it to make sure that when you come back, it will be here for you. And the master ends up taking it from him and gives it to the, gives it to the servant who has more. Brothers and sisters, we're called to be generous with our lives. To not just sit on couches and wait to see what's going to happen and hope that wealth will accrue because of that, but to be in God's creation, to be creative and to be useful and to multiply the good gifts that God has given to us. In Malachi, I think it's Malachi chapter 2, God says to them, they said, uh, he says, you guys, Israelites have been robbing me. And the Israelites say, how have we been robbing you? And he says, in tithes and offerings you have robbed me. Give to the house of God and see if I don't open up the window of heaven and rain down blessings on you. Church, we've been called into a new gospel. We've been called to the, to the changing, to the renewing of our thoughts, our minds. And one of the biggest areas of that that we've got to pay attention to, because let's be honest, you're probably going to pull out your card at least two or three times today as you make purchases, is the way we think about the resources that God has given to us. He's called us out to be good stewards. He calls us to give so that way it may be given to you in good measure, pressed down and overflowing. Brothers and sisters, God wants you to be rich in his resources, in his kingdom. Sometimes that looks different than the kingdom of the world. Sometimes, I'm just going to be flat out honest, sometimes that means when we're praying for us individually or somebody else who's sick, that means their illness does lead to death. Because Jesus rose again on that third day. If they have faith in Jesus, they're going to rise again when Jesus comes again. They will be healed from that illness. And sometimes it means we live in poorness. In El Zarillo, Mexico, which is just south of Tijuana, I've met some of the happiest kids in my life. They were kicking around a soccer ball that was just completely depleted. The outside skin of the ball was not there any longer. And they were full of joy, and they, had not, they were playing barefoot on a dirt street. In Spanish, El Zarillo means little skunk because the town stunk. It was, it was Tijuana's and uh, um, San Clemente's dump, trash dump. It smells there, and they were happy, and they were poor. 
probably because they had kingdom vision and maybe they didn't even know it. It's like my friends and I in high school when we shared our food for those who didn't have anything to eat. We're called out, church, to look out to the needs of those that are around us and let people take care of our needs as well when we have it, to trust in the kingdom of God, to not live with pride about our finances, but to let God have all of it. And God says, if you just trust me, if you just trust me, see that I don't open up the storehouses of heaven for you. In our Bible class this morning, the the book of Job was brought up. This is Job's story. Job loses everything, and God essentially says, it was, I think it was chapter 28, 29, was that right? God says, Job, trust me. He doesn't answer Job why he's going through all this stuff. Instead, he says, I created all things, trust me. And the story of Job ends with him having double everything that he had before, even though he was already the richest man on earth during that time. Our job, brothers and sisters, is to trust God with what we have the talents and the financial abilities that he has given to us. To not let the love of money create all kinds of evil, but to trust God and recognize that money is just a, um, oh, I can't even think of the right term. It's a bartering system, as we talked about earlier. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol of the, of the value of what God has created is really all it is. Everything God has made is good. Sin is the corruption of God's good things that he has made. So let us celebrate with the things that God has given us. Let us, let us give, trusting that God will always give back to what we have. Let us live lives that are full of service and full of goodness, trusting in him. Because the time is fulfilled now, says Jesus, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Change your thinking and believe in the gospel. Trust in him. In 1999, AVB Acapella Vocal Band came out with a song called Give. You can find it on Amazon Music. I found it there earlier today. You can find it on YouTube. If you use Apple Music, it'll probably be there. Again, search AVB and give. I challenge you, read Acts chapter 5 and 6 and look at the difference in in the focus on what giving was all about between those two different groups of people and listen to that song this week and you will be blessed. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus as you follow him. What God has blessed us with becomes more when we trust him and when we follow him. It's not health and wealth gospel. I'm not asking for a jumbo jet or a private jet to be able to fly. It's just the truth of what God's creation really is, what, what it's all about. Give and it will be given to you in good measure, pressed down, overflowing, so that way more giving can be done because that's what God's economics is all about. One of the things that I love praying over all of us is the, the priestly blessing. And by the way, in that pre- priestly blessing is a prayer for riches. So I pray the same thing for you, that Moses taught the priest Aaron and his, his uh, sons to be able to pray over God's people. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Gracious is a form of giving. And I pray the Lord turn his face to you and you know that he's turning his face to you and gives you peace.